Hey everyone, Rob here, and I have updates on the situation going on in Iceland, going on in Grindavik, and basically a, an array of news on what they're going to do with all of these residents of Grindvi Grindavik now that their homes and their town, I guess in essence, is pretty much uninhabitable in the eyes of the government. They're putting together a draft bill, or they have put one together, that they're proposing to relocate and buy out the residents of Grindavik. But first, this is coming from NASA, this, this image here that we're looking at, and they've said that, uh, as a recap, the volcanic activity reawakened on the Reykjanes Peninsula in southwestern Iceland with a pulse of eruptions in mid-January of 2024, and of course, in, to, in uh, December of last year as well. Over the course of two days, new fissures released lava near the town of Grindavik, as you can see there. A human-constructed barrier diverted some of the flow from one of the fissures away from the town, but lava from one closer one, that uh, fissure that opened up, of course, towards the bottom, that engulfed several homes. The eruption occurred less than a month after another fissure opened up several kilometers northeast, as we can see in this graph here, the 2023 eruption, and it was the fifth eruption on the peninsula since 2021. So the map here indicates the location and, and the extent of the recent activity that we've seen over the last, what, six weeks. And uh, data for the map was acquired from the Thermal Infrared Sensor 2 on the Landsat 9 satellite on January 16 of 2024 and overlaid on a digital elevation model of the area. Now the TIRS-2 detects thermal radiation in two different wavelengths, re revealing the amount of heat emanating from surfaces on Earth. Lava flows from the January 2024 eruption appear the warmest, which are yellow, while the still warm December 2023 lava flows and the Blue Lagoon geothermal pool, which you can see highlighted on the left there, also stand out from the relatively cooler bluish surrounding land. Scattered clouds, the light blue, account for areas with the coolest temperatures, as you can see, kind of in this middle end, so the top left. Now, again, to recap, the fissure eruption began at 7.57 a.m. here in Iceland on January 14, approximately one kilometer away from Grindavik, followed several hours of increased seismic activity, according to the Icelandic Meteorological Office. Some lava from this fissure flowed towards the town, while some was diverted to the west by the barriers that uh, we would see to be kind of right here where my mouse is. And the barriers were made of, you know, just dirt and rocks and, and various other sort of natural substances. And uh, the construction of all that in the Grindavik region actually started at the beginning of January, of, well, at the beginning of this year. Now, at 12.20 p.m., the same day of this January eruption, a second smaller fissure opened up, and that's this one down here below, this small one there, and that opened up outside the barrier at the edge of the town, and lava burned down three homes in the area. Now, drone footage from the day captured both flows, which turned out to be relatively short-lived, by the morning of January 16, the Icelandic Meteorological Office reported the activity was no longer visible and that the activity has uh, decreased, basically saying the end of the eruption. Now, stopping lava, which is just hot, molten rock, is not an easy thing to do. Past efforts have been met with mixed results. Famously on Iceland's Heimey Island 51 years ago, workers sprayed millions of tons of seawater on a lava flow's edge to cool and slow it, preventing it from actually destroying a harbor. Most recent efforts have taken the barrier approach, like at Grindavik, aiming to redirect lava on a less destructive path. And in this case, it's worked quite well with Grindavik, uh, with the exception, of course, the fissure that opened up within the city limits. Now, more battles with this lava flow on the Reykjanes Peninsula are assumed to occur in the future. Modeling showed that magma has moved beneath Grindavik and deformed the ground as much as 1.4 meters or 4.6 feet. Now, experts have told all the news sources that bursts of activity could continue in a cylindrical pattern. Basically, it's just going to keep going. Now, when we are talking about the land rise, here we have some charts, and we're going to go over some of it, but land has continued to rise again in Sengi 
And it's important to draw attention to the fact that there's, you know, no settling of the land, as we saw from the December eruption. We can see here that it was rising and then fell, and then it kept going up, but it didn't fall again on the second eruption on Jan in January of 2024. Now it softens significantly, so you can see here there's a little bit of a of a downturn here, um, but nothing compared to what we saw in December. Now asked what he thinks explains why the land has not yet sunk in Spotsengi, Armin Hulsen, professor of volcanology at the University of Iceland, he was saying that it shows the system is much more complex than scientists had previously thought. It's tough. In Skiptestrun and Elvorp, the only thing that it tells us is the area the magma is pushing into is more complicated and complex than they had thought, he says. Now, he's also thinking that all the chambers must be connected before they erupt in the first eruption, uh, or they had to be. Now, Svartsegi did not sink, and the magma may have come from other chambers that are connected. But of course, it wasn't a big eruption in January, and just a little pitter-patter here and there. So that could also be the reason why uh, we didn't see the sinking as we saw in some of the other ones. Now, geologist uh, Palmi Erlunson, he told the news agency MBF that the speed of this rise in Svartsengi has not changed since the eruption began in Grindavik, you know, just over a week ago. It's worth noting that the land in Svartsengi was not, uh, you know, that resilient when the eruption began, and unlike previous volcanic eruptions and well it gave way into the fissure that we saw in Grindavik. Palme says that the like the probable reason for all of this is the magma came from elsewhere much like what Armin had said as well. He notes that the land has subsided elsewhere for example in Eldvorp and Skip Sorshun which is west of Svartsengi um, but there is the land that sort of dropped about five centimeters. It's just a little different depending on on where the GPS and the measurement stations are. Now, one thing that we want to sort of point out here, though, is the GPS locations we can see north, east, and then, of course, the vertical, which we're looking at. But let's just pay attention to the Grindavik north and east. And what this is showing us is essentially in the town, and, and there's a lot of speculation on exactly what this means, but it means that the town is being literally torn apart by the two tectonic plates moving in opposite directions. And this could be a reason why we're seeing so much infrastructure damage and, you know, basically sinkholes and cracks and fissures inside of Grindavik. I mean, they lost all of their water. They've been losing power. The government is trying hard to put up backup water sources. And it could be because of this huge movement in the area. And you can see here in January eruption, we had quite a quite a quite a movement compared to what we've seen over the past couple months in Grindavik. And again, these are the GPS stations that they've been setting up. Now we have here HS Vetter, which is the basically company that runs all of the water. They have set up a backup water source in Arnet Arnet it's close as hard word in Garde for for about 25,000 residents of Reykjanesbær and Sørenesbær. Now, the, all of this work started last November when the earthquakes and all of that commotion started in the area of the Blue Lagoon and Grindavik. Now, the water source can serve residents and businesses in the area other than extremely large users, but it's assumed that the water source can deliver up to 100 liters per second. These measures, again, were all taken due to the earthquakes on the Reykjanes Peninsula, and their possible impact on the water source at Leugum near Svartsengi, which provides residents with drinking water. And this is all coming from an announcement from HSV. It's clear that if there is no potable water due to a natural disaster, the consequences would be an emergency, as drinkable water is a basic prerequisite for living and economic activities in the area to be maintained. It's therefore super important to ensure safe access to drinking water for the region, it said in the announcement. Now, the company had received a good understanding from the administration regarding the 
expired, uh, you know, the, the quicker processing of the required permits to start drilling and installing backup water sources for the residents. You know, all this stuff was pushed through very, very quickly just because of the situation that was ongoing and construction began on November 20th of this. So very, very soon after we saw quite the uh, the earthquakes going on in Grenivik. Now, numerous, numerous contractors have worked tirelessly on the project since that time. The reserve water source is an older water source that has now been expanded. Before there was one borehole, but now two more have been added. And, uh, you know, said in an announcement that it's a suitable location because it provides access to the drinking water distribution system of HS Werther in Reykjanesbær and Sjöldsnesbær, as well as, you know, defining a water protection area because uh, drinking water is definitely one of the biggest priorities, I think, that we can all agree is important in Grindavik. Now, the last thing I want to touch base on is kind of an indirect consequence of the news that I was mentioning yesterday with the government of Iceland essentially buying out or, or sort of moving the town of Grindavik, moving all these people. What's going to happen, they say, is housing prices are expected to rise when all of these people from Grindavik enter the real estate market in whether it be Reykjanesbær, Reykjavik, and the south coast, you know, all these things. This is going to basically increase the house prices because there's, what, 3,000 people that now need homes. And all of this is according to finance, the finance minister. Now, Landsbanken, which is one of the big banks here in Iceland, the economics department says the increase will depend on a lot of things, uh, but whether the indebtedness or tax collection will be, you know, how that's going to be handled. Now, yesterday, again, the government introduced measures that should enable the people of Grindavik to establish a safe home somewhere else other than the town of Grindavik, which is, you know, still closed. Uh, two government bills are currently being processed in the Ministry of Finance and Economy regarding the matter. Now, Thortis Gifladotir, who is the Minister of Finance and Economy, she says preparations are well underway. They have already started with how they would finance this. Of course, the Icelandic Treasury is in the position is in. You know, we're in basically this huge inflation situation in Iceland. So it has to show some responsibility. To make matters worse, we are actually in the middle of a, a union uh, negotiation where they have been asking the government to help out with lowering inflation as well in order to make everything work. Now, Thoris was saying that they also know the situation that 1% of the housing market, which is the population of Grindavik, so that's 1%, is entering the real estate market and it's of course going to affect housing prices. So they're, they're very much prepared or expecting that the house prices will increase in one way or another. And this is all stated yesterday that, again, without countermeasures, the real estate prices will rise by about 3%. And that's 3% more than they would have typically rose this year once they come in. So just a little bit of economic background of what's going to happen when a whole town is moved into another area. We're seeing that from here. Let's move into the final stage. This is quite a bit of a long uh, piece of information going on in this video. But let's take a look at some of the earthquakes that we are seeing. Let's just go to Icelandic because that's where it is. We can see in the Reykjanes Peninsula, whoops, just go into here. Uh, the seismic activity has calmed down more or less. And we're seeing what we saw before the previous eruption, which is very little activity and almost all of them, with the exception of a couple of Two, well, what, four of them uh, are below a magnitude of one. So we are uh, we're seeing sort of the calm before the storm. All the volcanologists, meteorological agency, everyone is saying brace for something in the near future. And uh, with the land rise continuing the way it is, magma is still flowing into the area. Uh, but if you do want to go to the area, there is the closest that you can get to the lava field, I believe, is the Blue Lagoon that is open for business, and it opened less than one week after the last eruption. So if you're going to go there, just be mindful that the situation is still as it is, as it's presented, and there could be an eruption or earthquakes or some other activity in the very near future. So just be mindful of the evacuation plan that they have in there. That's all the news there is right now. It's a lot to take in, but uh, as always, it's exciting time in Iceland. So until next time, thank you so much for watching.